good evening and a very, very warm welcome. My name is Magnus von Bistinghausen. I'm executive director of World Monuments Fund Britain. And we're really glad to see many of you tonight. We're competing with beautiful weather outside and a few other significant events around London. So thank you very much for being here. Um, I wanted to just start these few words to acknowledge um, and honor the legacy of our founding patron, Paul Mellon, and in whose honor we are here tonight and once a year, whose support was absolutely key uh, in setting up World Monuments Fund Britain uh, back in 1996. And of course, he's been one of the most generous advocates and funders of heritage in this country and of so many other causes, and not just in this country, of course, but, and well, but well beyond. Um, tonight's uh, event also marks our partnership with English Heritage uh, through our joint um, Coastal Connections project, which is very much at the heart of what we'll be hearing tonight. Uh, and this has really come out the 2022 nomination of Hearst Castle uh, to the WMF Watch Program, which, um, as you know, is, is one of our key um, moments to advocate for uh, heritage at risk around the world. The seeds of this project were sown all back uh, in 2019, when we, WMF Britain, led uh, a sea change conference in Blackpool, and Rob Woodside, who is here tonight, and Conservation and Estates Director at English Heritage, initiated uh, a discussion at the time, which has led us to this day. So, Rob, um, I don't know where, where, are, where you are, but there you are. Um, a, a very warm welcome to you tonight and to all your colleagues at English Heritage. And we look forward to hearing a few of your thoughts um, and observations later on uh, in the discussion. Uh, Coastal Connections uh, has provided the lens through which to look at the impact of climate change on coastal heritage sites uh, around the world. And again, you'll hear a lot more about this uh, very soon. And how we can all learn from each other's experiences and varied responses to the inevitability of change, especially when it accelerates, which is really what we're dealing with at the moment. Of course, change is all around us all the time, always has been and always will be. The question, therefore, is how we deal with it, uh, which gets us um, nicely to the topic of uh, tonight's lecture, which is not really a lecture, but a conversation. Um, this is very much a World Monuments Fund conversation rooted in our core mission to safeguard uh, cultural heritage where we can and where there is the will to do so, to give it a future aligned with the needs and aspirations of our time and a future which is socially, culturally, economically, and of course, ecologically sustainable and feasible. So now really uh, is the time without further ado to dive into the conversation. And for this, I'll be handing over to uh, John Darlington to introduce and host the conversation. John is my predecessor, now Director of Projects here at World Monuments Fund Britain, and also author of recently published um, uh, book, Amongst the Ruins, which uh, is a salutary tale of the rise and fall of cultures and the anatomy of loss. So um, um, very appropriately, the person to lead us through the conversation this evening. John. Please, come on, come on, come on, come on. Thanks. Right, thank you very much, Magnus. Whilst uh, the panel comes on board, you'll be seeing an empty chair there. That's why I'm particularly relieved to see Rob in the audience, because he's going to come and answer some questions at the very end. So, Rob, I'm glad you're here. Uh, I, I'm going to introduce the panel in, in a moment, but I really wanted to just set out a little bit of context for this conversation. Firstly, some very practical things. So uh, in the case of emergency, you can see the, the exit. So please, uh, no emergency is planned. So if there is one, please leave. Uh, secondly, that we are filming tonight, just to let you know. Uh, and thirdly, if you've got mobile phones, it'd be really good if you could turn them off or onto silent. So some practical things. In terms of the conversation this evening, it's, it's really going to be in three parts. And the first part, the first act, if you like, is for us to explore uh, the, the, the issue uh, in, in front of us at the moment. So this idea of loss of heritage, whether natural heritage, 
uh, or ecological heritage. So what, what does it look like and what is the scale of the issue? And then in our second part, because that's quite a depressing subject, I have to say, so the, dep the second part of this is, is what are the solutions? What do we do about the loss of heritage, particularly coastal heritage, uh, and how do we move forward? And then the final, the final act this evening is all about how do you engage communities? So this is such an important issue. How do you... Uh, you, in effect, are... I'm preaching to the converted. You're here because you're interested. But this subject is so important. We need to be engaging and having conversations with far broader groups of people. So that's the plan. After we've done that, uh, I will then invite Rob to come on stage and we will have a Q&A, which... So I would like you all to think of some really, really difficult questions for, for my panellists and especially for Rob. Uh, so, so that is the plan. The, the, the second thing to say is just coming back to World Monuments Fund. And we, as Magnus has said, are an organisation which is... Uh, our, our mission is to safeguard irreplaceable heritage across the, across the globe. And as such, we, we look at, I guess, four main themes, four main themes of activity which keep us very, very busy in regard to heritage. Uh, the first is how do you respond to, to crisis, wherever it might be, so war or earthquake or, or, or whatever it might be. So we, we're very much in that field, and we have people working in Ukraine, uh, and we've got great experience of, of that, those areas. Our second theme is about giving people a voice, so that diversity of uh, voices and people's engagement in heritage. The third is about tourism, and tourism can be absolutely fabulous for, for historic places, but it can also be a complete disaster. So what's the best way to get a balance in terms of tourism? And then the final topic is about climate change, which is why we're here tonight. And most of our, our conversations around climate change are, are based on uh, how, do you, how do you learn the lessons from the past? So how do, you, how do, do historic places tell you the story of past climate change? Or how do you adapt and mitigate a single place to cope with increased temperatures or sea level rise or whatever it might be? Uh, and those are well and good, but actually the, the, the topic which we are facing into tonight is actually more about the topic of loss. So where you don't necessarily have the solution to protect and preserve heritage, but eventually you're going to have to say goodbye. So this is the topic tonight. And the, that's really illustrated in this picture that you can see in front of you now. This is Herschel Island, which is on the Arctic coast of Canada. And really that, the, the picture summarises four things. Firstly, uh, a warming sea, which is making the, the ice there uh, melt earlier and freeze later. A rising sea, so the sea level is actually rising, and increased storming, storminess and storm conditions. And all of those, those uh, uh, have an impact upon the existing life of the people who live there, so the Inuit, uh, and indeed their cultural heritage, their past, their, the buildings and remains of the past. I said four because there's a fourth thing which this slide also illustrates, and that is the permafrost, which covers such a huge, huge area of the Northern Hemisphere. So this permanently frozen ground, which you can see in the top left-hand corner of that, that image, the permafrost is also thawing. And as it thaws, it releases methane, but also as it thaws, it disrupts the patterns of, of Inuit, Inuit activity uh, and it releases archaeology to the open air, which is destroyed. So the slide really illustrates all of these issues about the dramatic nature of heritage loss uh, in, in one single place. And the purpose of tonight's conversation is to, is to explore loss, to, to explore the issue, and then to, to look at solutions. So that's the plan. Uh, and now, now finally, I'm going to turn to, to my panel. So uh, on my left, on my immediate left, uh, there's Dr. Alex Kent, who is our Coastal Connections Lead for World Monuments Fund and English Heritage. Uh, he's a geographer and a cartographer, and he's a particularly brilliant at mapping, mapping uh, places cartographically across the world. Sorry, Alex, you have to have that. Uh, 
Then we have uh, Tanya Venture, who's an archaeologist and PhD candidate with the University of Exeter in Historic England. And Tanya has a particular expertise in how you engage communities in this subject and is the lead author of a piece of research called Articulating Loss, uh, the Articulating Loss Framework. So very much involved in the human dimension of things. And then finally, on the far left, we have Lizzie Daly, who's a, a wildlife uh, biologist, a broadcaster, and a, a conservation filmmaker who's currently studying for a PhD. And the reason I wanted Lizzie to be in the room is because too often, in terms of cultural heritage, we, we sit in our own train lines. We, we look at cultural heritage, and yet the same issues are being faced by the natural world. So we thought it'd be really good to, to connect across. So that's my panel. And uh, we're going to bring you into play now. We're going to make you work. So, so the, the, the first question then is, and I'm going to start with Alex, and that is, can you tell us something about a site which really brings these issues to life? Yeah, excellent. Thank you, John. And it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here as well, talking about this really important conversation that I think we all, all really need to start having. So I think that one of the key sites that we need to look at is, of course, Hearst Castle, and you will have seen this on your uh, flyers and uh, Inventbrite invitations and so on, the, the model of Hearst Castle. And Hearst Castle itself, the, the Tudor fort, was built 1541-1544 by Henry VIII, um, and then it was expanded in the 1860s, and you can see on the image here, but these huge gun batteries, the, the casemates that extend east and west along that spit. And that spit itself, uh, we're talking about really the, the, the south of Hampshire, opposite the Isle of Wight, the western end of the Isle of Wight, but still part of Hampshire. And that spit is around about uh, sort of a, a mile and a quarter long, maybe, jutting out into the sea. So we're talking about a really isolated uh, location, but then also a really vulnerable location as well. And in many ways, the story of Hearst Castle and its development over time kind of reflects, I think, a little bit the, the story of how perhaps we as a nation have responded to threats to our national security in terms of the coasts, but also maybe threats uh, from the sea as well. So a particularly vulnerable situation, you can see the, the, the salt marches behind. And in February 2021, part of the wall of one of those um, casemates, so well, a few of the casemates actually collapsed, and you can see the, the image here, the, the damage that they caused, and I think it, it is a reminder of just how vulnerable some of these places are on the coast, that we tend to think perhaps we look at one or two places and get um, sort of maybe that, that sort of silo thinking where we're, we're looking maybe just at the site itself and perhaps need to think beyond the site. So even though we have these very difficult challenges at Hearst Castle, Funny enough, it's a unique site, but actually those challenges are not uncommon. And part of the, uh, one of the, well, I, I suppose that the objectives, of course, of the uh, Coastal Connections Project is to look beyond Hearst Castle itself and look towards different partnerships we can make around the world, particularly with those coastal heritage sites that uh, are within English Heritage, within World Monuments Fund, the watch sites here that are on the coast, plenty of those around, but also UNESCO sites as well. And this is a rich compendium, really, of case studies of how you manage and mitigate and adapt to and change our thinking uh, when it comes to uh, well, the impacts of climate change, really. We see here lots of different examples. There's Rapa Nui, the, the Easter Island here on the, the sort of the west side of the map. There's also uh, the, the forts, the slave forts of Ghana that we see again subject to coastal erosion. And those of you that know a little bit about sea level rise, you'll also know that the Kwaganu uh, Monastery, or mosque, sorry, that you see in uh, the Maldives, again, that's one of those very, very vulnerable places, as is Venice as well. So there's a huge amount that we can learn from really understanding the wisdom, let's say, and the practical experience of what these places have to offer. So just stemming from Hearst Castle, I think there's a lot that we can, we can learn and uh, adapt from each other's thinking. And sometimes we'll need to do that, I think. Thank you, Alex. So, so what you're talking about is how you connect places across yeah. the world which are, uh, are, are, are faced with the same issue. Tanya, turning to you, you're, you're more about the people. We're not, not about the people, Alex, but Tanya, you're very much about the people. So how, how does loss feel for people in your realm? Yes, yeah, so my work really focuses on 
not just the communities, but also the practitioners that are looking after these places. So it's um, about opening dialogues between these two groups. Um, and one of the most important things that's kind of come out through my research is that nobody uh, experiences loss in the same way. It's completely personal. Um, and I've seen people being not that bothered to being extremely emotional about it. And it all depends on what kind of type of loss you're, you're dealing with and what kind of people that you're dealing with as well. So just to keep that um, broad experience of loss in your head when, you, you know, when, when thinking about this subject, there is no kind of cookie-cutter experience that everybody is going to have. Um, and I think that's really interesting when we start interrogating what heritage actually means. So when is heritage? What is heritage? Where, when do we freeze time and say this is, it can never change from this moment? And by looking at heritage in that way, you kind of move to this active rather than static uh, image of heritage, and it, it all becomes a lot more exciting at that point. Thank you, Tanya. And then I guess we, we look over into the natural world, Lizzie. So, so over to you. What, what are you seeing from your experience? Are there parallels? Yeah, and I think we talked earlier about what loss means too, right? And it's perhaps very different in my world to say what we're discussing here today. I guess for me, the impacts of climate change are very apparent, whether I'm in the field for my research or through film. And one of the main things that I see connecting all of these stories, no matter where I am, is the loss of biodiversity. Uh, you know, huge statistics, up to a million species are predicted to go extinct in the next few decades. And we're still learning about our biodiversity, still discovering new species. And there's whole environments that we haven't yet protected, let alone explored, to, you know, to still kind of delve into to understand what that kind of loss looks like. Um, most recently in March, I actually was in the Pantanal. It's, um, I'm not saying this just to make you all jealous. I promise this won't be like a postcard series, but uh, uh, we were actually filming a new series about jaguars that live in the south part of the Pantanal. It's the world's largest tropical wetland, beautiful place. And uh, do you know what? I was surprised at the number of days we were facing challenges, direct impacts of a changing climate. In this area, traditionally, you should have a wet season and a dry season. And this was the first time the scientists, so uh, the picture on my right, your right, uh, is a team called On Safari. They conduct Jaguar research all year round on the jaguars that can be found in the area. And this, this is the first wet season they've had for the past three years. We also, when we were out in the field, were experiencing huge extreme weather events, out of season, rains and storms. You know, I'm talking cars being crushed, build it, roofs being ripped off of buildings. So we were literally face to face with the impacts of, of climate change. And unfortunately, this is not just part of our storytelling now, but it's the reality and actually trying to film these stories in the first place. My background and my work, I've always had that interest in wildlife, and I knew I wanted to work with elephants early on. And I got this kind of big reality shock when, you know, when I was young, I thought, I want to conserve just elephants. And it was very species-focused. But after spending time in the field in Kenya, you soon realize that conservation doesn't just apply to the species. It's about communities. It's about environment and habitat protection, as well as uh, species like the African elephant. So um, we tagged a few bull elephants a few years ago, along with uh, Save the Elephants. And these bull elephants go in and crop braid in areas where there's huge numbers of communities and stresses to a natural environment. Their habitats are becoming fragmented, so they're being pushed to eat the crops of local people. And of course, that's put it, putting stresses on their livelihood when they're having their entire crops raided overnight. And um, this was, again, a reminder for me that actually my perception of how to conserve and an appreciation for the natural world has to include people stories, has to include the wider context and the environment as well. And, and coming to, I mean, so there are, there are plenty of parallels which are emerging, uh, as we know, but coming to the coastal environment, why is that particularly difficult? Alex, do you want to pick that one up? Yeah, good question. Well, I live by the sea. I grew up by the sea. I moved away from the sea, didn't like it, moved back. Um, <laughs> well, the coastal environment, as you, you know, will all know, it's a volatile, unpredictable, highly dynamic environment. Um, and that 
creates a, a combination, really, of so many complicated challenges, certainly the unpredictability of it. And I think as we're seeing the increase, let's say, for example, in um, frequency of, of storm events, particularly intense storm events, that makes it even harder to really in a way, control some of the impacts and effects that we're seeing on the coastal environment. So I think that makes it exceptionally difficult, then, if we're looking at managing coastal sites, particularly heritage sites, how are we going to do this sustainably? And that means that we need to change, I think, a little bit about our approach to looking at perhaps conservation, that we're looking at something that, or environment that changes all the time, away from something that doesn't change, we want to preserve it the way it is. So, you know, something we have to be really clear about is that, you know, climate has always changed, and co coastal processes always show us change, for example, um, but the rate of those changes are, are accelerating, and it's something we have to do, I think, something about. There's a huge opportunity that we have. But, you know, I like to sprinkle, and John, I hope will forgive me for this, I like to sprinkle a little bit of optimism just maybe a little bit early on, which is that it's not so... Um, always so one-sided. We tend to think of uh, coastal erosion, for example, and the negative impacts of that. But sometimes, as in a coast like this, other down Glamorgan in Wales, we can see how coasts sometimes reveal um, new perspectives, new insights, new finds, certainly archaeologically, to us to understand a little bit more about our inhabitation of those coastal areas. So perhaps it's not all, all doom and gloom, but... Um, Certainly, they're a very, very complica complicated and challenging environment to manage sustainably. And I think that's why there's this great opportunity to learn from one another in how we do that. I'd just like to add, actually, the, um, the idea of kind of the, the idea that loss is a failure and that's the worst possible outcome is something that sort of I've been trying to challenge in my work by looking at the language that we use around loss. So instead of saying, oh, this place is going to be lost, and that's big, scary, amorphous thing, like, what does that mean? What will that look like? Nobody knows, because it's, it's too big. So what I've been trying to do with my articulating loss framework is actually say, OK, well, what does loss look like to these places? And that allows us to look at the challenges associated with loss, but it also allows us to look at the opportunities. So where we've got uh, the slide behind me, you've got opportunities in that landscape. With every rockfall, you have new potential for, for, uh, for, for new discoveries. And there are opportunities for engagement through, through more learning opportunities for investigation in all types of loss. There's no, it, it doesn't have to, to be the end. Uh, it can actually open the doors to a new beginning. And it's about seeing that potential and really kind of honing in on the positivity and the transformational nature of loss rather than just seeing it as something to be avoided at all costs. And I, I guess as an archaeologist myself, when, when we look back over millennia, that the one thing that you can guarantee that we can see, in fact, the only thing you can guarantee that you can see is change. And change will include loss and growth and rebirth and all those things. Lizzie, from your perspective, we, we're, we're talking about coastal zones. Again, there's a slightly different dynamic for you in that you've got the coastal zone as in the cliff, but you've also got the marine environment beyond. Now, there is archaeology in that, but there's, there's, you know, wildlife is a far more important feature, I'd argue. Yeah, and that's where things get really complex, and I love your optimistic kind of approach to that, and I'm about to probably shatter it by saying it's a huge challenge. And that's a huge jellyfish, if you haven't noticed. Uh, that's a barrel jellyfish taken in Cornwall, actually, because I'm, I'm really passionate about celebrating our coasts here. Um, I think, you know, as an island nation, it should be something we're really proud of and, and excited about, and that, I guess, inspiration for me started in Wales out with a snorkel on, um, like this. But uh, we came across a giant jellyfish a few years ago, and what was exciting was uh, everyone was talking about jellyfish when normally they're running away in fear. Um, but actually, it led to me asking lots of questions about, you know, how do jellyfish move? And they're actually deliberate. You know, they're not just giant blobs that float through the ocean. They actually move up and down water columns feeding and have quite deliberate behaviours, can you believe? But, um, yeah, it's just an example of my introduction into my love for uh, marine life. But um, if we can go to the next slide, I think... I'm going to give you a few examples of how things can be really complicated. So this is a leopard seal. This is taken in Antarctica. And the impacts of a changing environment uh, can be seen all over our oceans. And this is just one of those examples. So 
loads of, um, there's a whole, uh, well, they're quite solitary leopard seals, but that also seems to be changing as time goes on and resources change. But on the West Antarctic Peninsula, you get leopard seals like this one, and they're here to feed on penguins, seals, and, and on Antarctic krill. A lot of people don't realize, but that makes up a large part of their diet. Now, Antarctic krill depend on the algae that sits on the, uh, the underside of a lot of sea ice. And of course, you mentioned already the loss of sea ice. So you're seeing that cascading effect of loss of sea ice, loss of algae, loss of Antarctic krill. And that's impacting the movements of leopard seals in ways that we don't even really realize. So suddenly, you've got leopard seals who are maybe resident to that peninsula moving across the Southern Ocean, traveling thousands of kilometers to South Georgia. So suddenly, that protection that you've put in place for one species is open to a whole ocean. Um, that's also the case, um, well, in Australia, there's, um, we did a series in January where we were filming with uh, variety marine life around the coast of Australia to showcase you know, the impacts of climate and various marine stories. But this is, uh, this is me next to some grey nurse shark. Has anyone heard of grey nurse sharks? No, great. They're awesome. They're so peculiar in every single way. So there's over 40 of these females. They kind of just linger around this rock called wolf rock. Unfortunately, they're a critically endangered species. They're pushed to that status uh, through hunting. But now the main threat that they face in, the, in terms of their extinction is the impacts of our climate. And that's all down to their life history. They are long-lived shark. They live over 25 years. They don't reach sexual maturity until about six to eight years old. They also only have, well, they have low fecundity, so two pups in every two years. So over, you know, we talk a lot about time frames in our climate and changing climate. So over that short amount of time before a female has even got to being sexually mature, what changes are happening to our oceans along that coast? They're very limited to certain inshore habitats, and so unfortunately they're just one of the species that w we don't know, you know, are going to be, whether they may be extinct in the next... Uh, 50 or whatever it may be years because of these huge challenges. And the reason I'm giving you these different case studies is because I think we like to simplify how to conserve or put a sticker on, you know, that's a protected species. But in the marine environments and coastal environments, you're dealing with species that are transient, they migrate, they, um, you know, ocean dwelling, they cover huge areas. And I think the scale of the problem when you start to learn about these species and their life history becomes real. <laughs> and it's, it's a real contrast, actually. Uh, one of the things that from our early conversation was uh, there are similarities and differences between the natural and uh, 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 cultural environments. But as you describe it there, you know, small changes, seemingly small changes, can have dramatic effect, which moves species literally thousands of miles away. Whereas in the natural, in the cultural heritage world, we're, we're dealing actually with quite a simple, you know, you might lose a metre, five metres of coast. So it's, it's a much more, I'd say, not an easier uh, issue to face, but you can see the, the complexity of the challenge in the natural world. Which brings me actually to my, my next question, which is, again, as cultural heritage people, we, we, you know, we, we look at landscapes, but we, we also tend to concentrate on an individual site, whether it's a castle or whether it's a, a manor house and maybe it's immediate grounds. Uh, but clearly, in terms of climate change, we need to... Well, do we need to look wider, Alex? Yes. Next <laughs> question. <laughs> I think one of the key things with coastal environments especially, of course, is their interconnectedness. Um, and anyone who, well, in fact, anyone, as we were in the Royal Geographical Society with IBG, I mean, anyone who remembers doing their geography at school will probably remember, you know, terms like longshore drift, where you see the, the movement of shingle across the, the coast and this sort of thing. And that, that key point with that, which is that if you intervene at one part of the coast, then it's, of course, going to affect another part of the coast further down. So if you intervene by putting groins, for example, which stop the processes of longshore drift and stop the shingle being replenished along the coast, as is the case places like Hearst Castle, then, of course, there's going to be some erosion that will take place from, uh, from the sea without having that replenishment of shingles. So I think it's very important to remember there is that interconnectedness. But I think the other uh, key point that perhaps links to this as well is that these effects, when we're talking about perhaps not so much um, intervention, but the actual effects of coastal erosion and um, 
certainly the frequency of storms, this sort of thing. We see a lot of these that are actually increasing. And so we could say, actually, that we need to get used to this idea of loss. And, and how we cope with that idea of loss is, is something which is starting to perhaps seep into our consciousness maybe a little bit more than it has done. Certainly with organisations like Climate Central here, um, there's a, a great selection of sort of comparison images that they came out with. I think this was after COP26, where they were saying, even if we maintain um, a sharp drop in... Uh, carbon emissions and the, the, the temperature rises by 1.5 degrees, you're still going to get scenarios like this, for example, and then, of course, there are worse scenarios. So losing sites like this, maybe in the middle of central London, we were talking earlier about the Thames barrier and whether that's not really going to be fit for purpose anymore, that might be something that, of course, we have to... Um, I wouldn't necessarily embrace, uh, say that, but we have to certainly consider it more and more. It certainly has to get into the, the public conversation a lot more. Hence why I think this is a really good thing that we're talking about, but interconnectedness. Yeah, I, I, I'd just like to kind of bring up with Lizzie's uh, kind of subject as well, crossover, on the, the natural and the cultural, because it's, it doesn't have to be a natural or a cultural. You don't have to choose. Um, quite often the natural world does exist within cultural spaces. So, um, like, you, my supervisor, Caitlin De Silva, has done a lot of work on this with her um, curated decay. And again, it goes back to that idea of heritage being an active process rather than heritage making being an active process. So what is heritage? Um, can it be, you know, it's a reflection of today's society, what we find interesting, what we find important, we want to bring into the future. Um, and her work really discusses, well, actually, if we kind of reimagine our relationship with that material past and what that material past can do, then we can actually engage with it and, and allow non-human actors, so thinking about plants and animals and things like that that might um, end up uh, coexisting in these spaces. And it doesn't have to be an either-or choice. It, it is actually very kind of symbiotic relationships. If you think about ruins, actually part of their value is that they are you know, in these spaces where the natural and cultural world kind of combine. And actually, if you were to, well, with Anchor Watt, take out that tree, you've actually lost something there that goes beyond just the natural loss. You've actually lost a cultural loss as well. Thank you, Tenny. So, so essentially, we need to think differently about the term loss. We need to be careful of it and think of it more as a transition from one state to another state, and we can see that illustrated here. And interestingly, with Angkor Wat, you have the, 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 the kind of great cultural empire, and then that disappears, and you get the jungle taking over. And now, so it's cultural activity, then natural activity, and now, of course, our response is, well, this is a fantastic place that tourists want to visit, so some of the trees are beginning to go. So it, 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 it transitions from these different states and will continue to transition to different states. So we're now, we're now actually getting into solutions. So this is the happy bit of the lecture, <laughs> uh, the talk, uh, where we look at solutions. And again, I'm going to go back to you, Lizzie, and to, to, to think about or to tell us something about some of the solutions which are available to us in the natural world. Mm. Yeah, just on that point as well, very quickly, there are loads of creative ways that you can actually create, you know, put in place that coexistence. Uh, so as an example, in Cardiff, I know that as part of the university, they actually have beehives on the top of the university and they've set up on roundabouts areas of wildflower meadows. And it's created this network of suitable habitat for bees to flourish in the city centre, which I think is just an awesome thing, that closeness of, of wildlife, even in a really busy city. Likewise, nature will transition to, right? So peregrine falcons, fastest bird in the world. We have them in Cardiff, screeching over the high streets. No one notices but me. Um, but it's a, it's a really amazing thing how they've adapted to these environments to the point where they're using the reflections on the glass of uh, skyscrapers to look for the shadows of prey and pigeons and use that to their advantage to hunt, which I think is just awesome. Uh, but yeah, I mean, a really great case study right on my doorstep is uh, Skoma's Marine Conservation Zone uh, around Skoma Island. Again, a Welsh, I'm going to bang on about being from Wales, but um, it's a Welsh island that is just flourishing with life. And it was established as a marine nature reserve in 1990 and went on to become a marine conservation zone in 2014, which meant that there's a higher level of protection and all that seabed habitat 
basically um, being protected from any kind of destructive activity, whether it's trawling or anything of that nature. So eel grass and eel grass beds and sand eels are flourishing, and as a result, you now have the largest colony of Manx shearwaters on the island. You've got puffins at your feet everywhere you look. It's a haven for porpoise and marine life and seabird colonies, and I think it's a great example and, and of, of what happens if you let nature do its thing, if you actually put in place areas of well-managed protection, because um, I know that that whole, you may have heard of plenty of different acronyms of marine protection. There's marine protected areas, highly marine protected areas, marine conservation zones, and they all mean different things, but I think it's important in the context of thinking about how we create positive solutions to really have these small case studies and use them as a, as a good example of really what we should be doing. And I suppose that's similar, I mean, when, when humankind gets creative, we can do all kinds of amazing things. So we can, we can facilitate the protection of, of these magnificent birds mm. and the, the habitats in which they live. And we can do fantastic things in terms of moving heritage. So that is one solution. Do you want to pick that one up, Alex? Yeah. An example that you might have heard of uh, is the, the moving of the watchtower in Bude, um, Cornwall, where this is a, a community led initiative, community funded initiative, which then led to heritage funding. And because the community of Butte felt that this, well, for a start, it was endangered, it was right at the end of the cliff, they wanted to move it, but because they felt that it was so strongly part of the sense of place of Butte, then they raised the money, and I think it was around about 50,000, the heritage lottery fund was another 250,000, something along those lines. But the money was raised so that they could move this and the watchtower could still then be part of, of course, that sense of place and part of that landscape, which the people really wanted. And I think that, that picks up a little bit of what you were saying, Tanya, very much, this whole idea of heritage being active. It's not necessarily, perhaps you might think of it as a dead end almost, or, or something which is passive, I think you were talking about earlier. So. The fact that we can intervene in new and creative ways, and sometimes that involves dismantling and rebuilding. Not everywhere uh, will that be a solution, and certainly cost will be a huge factor in terms of whether that would be a solution or not. But I think it's worth exploring some of these different solutions and seeing um, what the community really wants. And I think that is a, maybe a key element of what you're looking yeah, at, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, again, like what I'm, what I'm looking at is opening the dialogues between practitioners and communities and actually asking the questions for both sides as well. Like, what is it that's important about this landscape or this particular place or this piece of heritage? And is, is moving it, is reconstruction the best thing for it is, it, is there something else? And, not, and this won't happen in all cases. You know, say you have a harbour, um, you can keep rebuilding it, but if the landscape to either side goes, you're going to wind up with a harbour in the middle of the sea, um, which isn't very good for anyone. So how do we navigate that? And I, a lot of it comes down to communication um, and very I like active listening, uh, engagement strategies where you actually go uh, and, and collaboratively come up with a plan with the community that everyone's happy with. Um, and that does sometimes come with constraints. So, so I mean, the, when you look at things like this, this, this project, and I'm sure the same in, uh, the equivalents in, uh, in the natural world, the cost of this project was £300,000 to, to move this small watchtower 100 metres down the coast so it's protected. But it was endorsed by the local community. When we look at a place like Hurst Castle, the cost could be in tens, tens of millions of pounds. And that might be exactly the right solution for Hurst Castle. But the point is, money is going to come into play with heritage across the world and with the natural world. So we have to think, and we, we can't afford to protect, nor should we want to protect absolutely everything. So we do need to think very differently about different approaches to to saying goodbye to recording. Again, Alex, over to you. Yeah, I think that's a very good question that you raised about um, maybe the difference between should and could, whether we should or could preserve heritage as well, because sometimes often we'll look at technological solutions, we'll think, well, here's a, an example of this where we can physically move heritage along the coastline. It may be that we can physically move heritage greater distances, greater projects. I mean, some of you, I'm sure, remember Abu Simbel and moving this away from the, the lake and so on when that was created in Egypt. But 
ultimately, that isn't going to work for everywhere, as you were saying, John. And I think that, that key question of really what we want to see is going to be a really important one, what communities want to see, and how they are responding, perhaps creatively, in ways that don't necessarily cost uh, maybe hundreds of thousands or tens of millions of pounds, because perhaps, obviously, they, they don't have it. And perhaps we need to think also that, that maybe the attitude of preservation is actually bound up with privilege. Um, and looking globally, of course, a lot of sites, particularly heritage sites around the world that are located on coasts, those nations perhaps do not have the resources, financially or otherwise, to be able to do uh, or to invest so much in the preservation of sites. So we have to look at what some of these different options and, uh, and solutions might be. So you might have heard of Tuvalu uh, fairly recently announcing that it was going to create a, a digital version of the islands, for example, and how there is investment in the preservation of uh, of record, if you like, as a step forward. Now, obviously, in, in the UK, we'll talk about monitoring and mapping and modelling and so on. You'll see the, the model of Hearst Castle that was on the, the flyer, for example. It gives us a sense of capturing what the place is like or the site is like. But whether that's going to be, again, a solution for everywhere, we might have to see. And I think that perhaps that, that approach, maybe if we, we call it sort of like a, a digital migration to lossless heritage, maybe something along, the, along those lines, of course that can never replace the physicality of what we see that, that creates the sense of place. But maybe, Tanya, again, um, drawing from your work, there is something about perhaps the emotional space and the emotional connection that perhaps it gives you as well that uh, is worth thinking about. And again, there are lots of other uh, case studies as well, like, for example, using mangroves in Tanzania to slow the effect of coastal erosion, this sort of thing. But actually being creative about how we maybe reimagine a lot of these places and maybe construct and develop our emotional uh, attachment to them, that may well be something that we look towards doing yeah. creatively, I think. And again, like understanding what the best way of preservation is. There's a huge footprint, carbon footprint, associated with storage on the internet. And so we really always have to go back to the question of why. Why are we doing this? What are we doing? Who are we doing it for? Are we doing it just to make ourselves feel better in the moment? Um, I, you know, I know a lot of projects where you do some scanning and then it gets put in a drawer for a million years and nobody ever sees it again. But it makes you feel good in the moment because at least it's preserved, even if it will never see the light of day again. So what I'm, I mean, I guess I'm looking at is when we are confronted with loss, how do we create uh, an engagement strategy which allows for the emotional kind of um, capacity to take people's feelings about loss and actually work through them instead of putting them off for maybe another decade or another generation. So you can't intellectualize grief. You can't. You can't get a pamphlet and say, in three, in three days you're going to feel awful, in a year you're going to get over it, and in two years you'll look back and write a memoir. Perfect. That does, it doesn't happen like that. You have to feel the feelings that you're going to feel. And sometimes it's going to be anger, and sometimes there's going to be pushing back. Sometimes there'll be acceptance, that whole five stages thing. It can go in any order. It's not exactly even accurate sometimes. But you, you need to provide a space, and this is what my work is doing, is sort of providing practitioners a, an engagement strategy which allows for that emotional space, that big outburst of whatever emotion people might feel. And again, it could be nothing. People might not feel anything about it, you know? And you have to be prepared for that too. So it's kind of like when it comes to the point that you actually have to confront loss, how do you do that in a healthy way? And a big part of my work is conceptualizing, OK, so how are we going to deal with this emotion? Because realistically, it is an emotional reaction that you're going to be dealing with before you then can go on to the positivity and the opportunities and face the challenges of you know, managing a site into decline. And I, I guess for us, if you to define conservation from the cultural point of view, 
conservation is, for me, is best defined as the, the careful management of change. So to your point, you're, you're giving space and time for people to get used to changes happening and to come to terms with it. So I think that's an important one. I want to move now from, from just to something quite specific and very briefly to look at having those conversations with communities. As I said at the very beginning, we're kind of very much talking to a, a, an audience who are interested to learn about this. But these conversations need to happen and we need to engage people in different ways, in, in a much wider way. So I just wanted to kind of conclude, really, in terms of a question uh, for each of you about uh, how do we engage people, how do we invite people into the debate? I think that's a really, really good question. <laughs> Ultimately, <laughs> I love the way you're looking at me with that one. <laughs> Ultimately, I think that is crucial uh, partly because also during what Tanya was saying earlier, I think your point about involving communities early on, and you will no doubt corroborate that as well, but I think also the whole idea of being adaptable um, in our outlook maybe to value the different approaches and different perspectives that we bring, each of us brings when we think about heritage and what that means to us. Um, and I think valuing and respecting those approaches and perspectives uh, is crucial for actually building ways forward on this to make people feel that actually their approaches to heritage are, are valued as well. And it may well be that on that journey, and I think it really is important to, to sort of see this as a journey, particularly for places that are uh, really facing the impacts of climate change and potentially loss, as we might want to sort of put it in inverted commas, potentially because it is a journey that is an emotional one as well as maybe a, a rational one in terms of thinking about the significance of places. But something I, I think we could always draw inspiration from as well is maybe looking at nomadic cultures, perhaps, and thinking when you embed culture in the, the people and you take it away necessarily from the, uh, the built heritage, there is something very powerful about taking heritage with you. Um, and maybe there is a, perhaps a, a few lessons we can learn in terms of adaptability and attachment to heritage, which is a, a sort of a peopled heritage, if you like, away from maybe the object and away from built heritage. But um, maybe it's a bit controversial me saying that. Hopefully I won't get my P45 for saying that. But I, think <laughs> but I think it is very, very important to consider those different approaches that are beyond the built. I think that's, that's essential. And I think that's all part of what makes us human as well, not just built heritage, but the broad, broad spectrum of heritage, I think. Yeah, and I'd, yep. I'd actually really like to add to that. Once you start seeing heritage, whatever it is, as a, an active thing, you can start to question your own space. Are we custodians for the future? Like, are we saying that we're going to take something and we're going to protect it because of the for future generations? What happens when that future never comes? Because there's always going to be a future generation. You know, seeing heritage as an active process allows us to actually use our heritage. And actually, it's a really useful tool when considering bigger changes out there. So we're looking at, we are going to be looking at, at massive changes all over the world. So things like infrastructure, housing, um, not just the heritage that we value. So actually, one of, the, one of the threads that I'm working on is how do we use that heritage as a tool rather, rather than a thing to protect? How do we actively use that to help understand, like further our understanding of, 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 our, of the changing the, sorry, of the changes that we are expecting. So in that way, it is not just some helpless thing that we have to protect at all costs for a future that, you know, is hypothetical, never comes. It is something we can actively use now to contextualise changes which we will be going through in the, in the very near future. I would also add that it, it is the same in wildlife film. You've seen that evolution, especially recently. Um, that idea is very much disrupting how we tell stories because I think traditionally in natural history broadcasting, well, for a very long time, it wasn't mentioned, climate change, wasn't a thing. And then um, more recently, the way programmes are even being funded, even through philanthropy funding, it's allowed... I guess the reality of the state of our planet to be conveyed in the best way and in refreshing ways to audiences to get them engaged. Wildlife film is all, is all about kind of getting to the heartstrings and making you feel like you should care and connecting you with that frog or with that coastline. Um, they get the frogs. Um, but actually, I think one of the important things about the storytelling is who tells these stories. And that's kind of to your point, is like now, well, 
wildlife films are being predominantly shown in the global north, okay, but we also are some of the biggest contributors to the climate crisis. And there's the global south, which a lot of these areas that we are saying, we should come and protect your area when these are the people who, A, should be telling these stories, and B, have ownership over this land or wildlife and wild spaces. So we're starting to see that shift in the narrative and who's telling these stories and the sort of stories about our natural environment that we are telling. Thank you, Lizzie. And so, I mean, there, there's so much in this conversation. So, so thank you for that uh, and for the very wide-ranging debate. And we could literally go on for hours. We're not going to. Uh, the, I guess I, I just want you to ask, answer one final question very briefly uh, before we throw it out to the, to the audience, and that is, uh, could you just kind of tell me one thing that either you take away from this conversation or you'd like other people to take away from the conversation? So again, I'm going to go to you first, Alex, and then we'll go down the line, and then we're going to open it up to the, <laughs> the audience. Sure, yeah. I think one of the key things that you, you see that I've learned from, from this really is about how elastic maybe that concept of heritage is. And coupled with that, what immense creative capital and potential we have to really transform the heritage we've got and the heritage we're going to have. And if you look around in a lovely city, if you look around and you see what is valued as the, uh, maybe the built heritage that you see, that's valued largely, I would have thought, in many ways, because of the creative capital that's invested in, in the creation of those buildings. So I think maybe we need to not get the idea that that value of creative capital only exists in the past. It's something which we have in the present. And if we harness it, then I think there's a really bright future, not just for, for now, but also for future generations that might be able to look back and say, OK, that was a, a time when really there was a, a sense that there was a valuing of creative capital in the present. And um, given that we've got a, a climate crisis, there's no time like the present to be harnessing, I think, that creative capital. So I think taking that forward be the creativity and the creative potential that we have to transform heritage, I think. Yes, yeah, so for, for me, it's realising and understanding that loss isn't a failure. Like, there are opportunities in loss and they are there to be, you know, engaged with. And that's exciting and there's so much potential. And that and the fact that we should be talking about loss now. We should be starting this conversation about what heritage loss means and what it looks like and how we are going to react to it now, Before even in sites where the loss isn't even apparent. We should be weaving in these narratives and we should be re to, ex to fully kind of explore the potentials that we'll get in the future. And I'd say, you know, there's lots of lessons to be learned from nature. Um, nature is highly adaptable and very resilient, so we should learn from that and take lessons, lessons from that. And for me, this is a brilliant conversation to be part of. You know, to, we should be celebrating these inter intersectional conversations, and, and I feel like that's what's really going to lead to impactful behaviour change in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So I'm now going to throw this open to the floor. We've got some roving mics. I'm going to invite... Uh, uh, Rob to come up onto the stage. Uh, so uh, Rob Woodside is the Conservation and Estates Director for uh, English Heritage. Rob, there is your microphone. You can take my, my seat there. Thank you. And whilst you're thinking of questions and locating the mics, I think the, 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 the obvious question for Rob, since he's now on the stage, <laughs> is uh, what does this conversation mean, or what does this topic mean for for organisations such as English Heritage. So English Heritage are custodians of our, of our built heritage. What does it mean for you as the, someone at the, the coalface? Thank you, John. Um, well, this has been a really interesting conversation, but it's more than a theoretical discussion. This is, this is for me, real life, because I'm responsible for Hearst Castle, um, and I'm responsible for thinking about what do we do and how do we react to this sort of change. Um, so... When the opportunity came to um, nominate Hearst Castle um, to the World Monument Watch um, came up, I, I really wanted to do it because I wanted to elevate the debate. I didn't want this to be an unfortunate incident down the end of this bit that people are going to grumble about, but actually something bigger, because I recognise that what we're facing at Hearst Castle is, as you've heard tonight, issue that we've seen all over the place. The challenge at Hearst is that it's just um, monumentally expensive 
And this is a fact that we have to take into account when we're thinking about um, coastal management and coastal change and protection of heritage, is that you know, there, is, there is a limited purse to be able to deal with this. So we have to make some, some choices. Now, some of the quotes I've seen from our structural engineers about what can you do with the site are, are really eye-watering, really challenging. And there's no way that an organization, a, a charity like English Heritage, can support that. So we have to think differently. Letting go, um, managing change is, is a difficult situation for a charity like English Heritage who exists to protect monuments like this. This is why we're here. Um, so we have to make some very careful, informed decisions about the future. Because we're not just dealing with the loss we've seen here, and we, we have already dealt with loss. We are dealing with other structural failures in the building, and we're facing um, a loss of coastline and shingle, a very dynamic environment. Add to that sea level rise. You know, we are facing some very tough times, I think. But also, I think, potentially some really good debates and some really different kind of thinking come, come, in, come into this, how we perceive the site and, and how we want to interpret it and engage with communities, visitors, everyone else in the future. So there's an element of watch this space because that thinking will evolve, evolve over the next year plus. It, it will do. And I think the, the, we've just completed a big feasibility study to look at the, the structural stability of the site, understanding uh, the impact of uh, sea level rise over time. Uh, working also with the Environment Agency to think about what they're doing, lot, not just at Hearst, but all the way along the coastline, because we can't just see Hearst Castle in isolation. Um, but I think we need to think about Hearst Castle as, as a site where we want to tell a different story. So there's great stories about Henry VIII and, and later Victorian defences and, and the defence of the realm. But there's also a great story to tell about, about change, about how you adapt, you know, we need to reimagine Hearst Castle as, as the English Heritage Centre for Climate Change um, and, and uh, not look forward as well as looking back in our remit. Thank you, Rob. So if anyone would like to ask a question, stick your hand up. We've got a couple of roving mics. There's a question there. So we'll start there and then go there and then there. So one, <laughs> two, three. So perhaps this one first here. Hello. It's on. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name's Hannah. I'm the chief executive of the Portsmouth Naval Base Property Trust. So I have under my care the Portsmouth Historic Dockyard, flood risk, and Priddy's Hard in Gosport, even bigger flood risk. Um, so I'm interested in the intersectionality and also in drawing it down into the completely practical of actually what do we need to change and what needs to give because as I look at the redevelopment of Pretty's Hard, we've got 26 listed buildings, um, an amazing community attachment, a fantastic opportunity to regenerate a heritage site for the benefit of the community. However, natural England would have to give in order for us to put flood defenses in place that would allow us to regenerate that heritage. Historic England would have to give and say, actually, no, PV panels are acceptable if they're visible from the ground. We need to address that bigger issue of how we can preserve our heritage sites um, and deal with climate change at the same time. So where do we need to flex first? That, I, I asked for good questions. That's a very good question. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll kick off part of an answer, and that is that I think there's something about our legislation, which is legislation which is out of date or will be out of date because it can't cope to this idea of dynamic heritage and dynamic uh, coastal environments. So I think there's something around we have to, we have to change our legislation to, to build into it flexibility and the acknowledgement of change. I don't know if any of the other panellists would like to add to that. Yes, I mean, <laughs> you know, very, very difficult, isn't it? I mean, a couple of things strike me maybe early on and these will probably, well, it might be helpful, let's see. But I think involving the community as much as possible is something that I think, you know, you, you really seem to learn from. It's easier said than done to do that. But I think that is a really important element of the whole debate about what should happen going forward, not what could happen and so on, or whether it's possible, but what should happen. Um, so I think that's, that's really crucial, involving the community. Um, 
I think the other angle of this, which I think is really, um, you know, again, with Hearst Castle makes the, the point as well, the, the value from those discussions with other organisations and other partners, HE, uh, EA, Environment Agency, and so on, difficult to have early on sometimes, but I think the earlier those discussions have, the better. Um, so I think having those discussions with stakeholders as early as possible is probably the best way forward. And the only um, sort of uh, uh, sort of example maybe that's not even similar, I tell you, but a kind of analogy almost, is with uh, looking at the, the uh, fortified training post in Ghana, for example, where uh, not too far down the coast, you're looking at whole communities having to move because of the threat of sea level rise. And what the... Um, the managers of that whole coastline we're finding is that the earlier they have those conversations with the communities and with any of the stakeholders, the easier there is acceptance of those decisions, no matter how difficult those decisions might be to swallow. And I know that's an easy thing just to say, but I thought that was a very interesting telling example from, from that part of the world, that involving those conversations and people in those conversations early actually then I think can really help. But... I you know, appreciate easier said than done. Not everyone is going to be happy. It's, it's a tricky one. Does anyone else want to add that, to that? It's, I think legislation needs to change and to have more adaptability in it. Engaging communities, sure, that needs to change uh, or needs to, you need to engage and as early as possible. And I think there is something definitely around those, those big organisations actually getting together. So you mentioned the Environment Agency and Historic England and so on and so forth, because the solutions for Hearst Castle will not just lie with my, my friend to the left here. They will definitely lie in a whole range of organisations down the coast, and in, that's the only way you're going to get a solution. And I'm, I would suggest exactly the same thing in, in, in Portsmouth. Can we move on? There was another question over there, just there, please. Uh, Kira, thank you. There's a microphone coming to you. Um, hello, I'm a student from UCL, and my, uh, my major is cultural heritage, and my research focus is on some traditional village uh, cultural heritage management. And uh, in Hainan province, in the Chinese tropical island, they have some cultural heritage sites in traditional villages suffered from storms and uh, the rains and other plants covered situation. And I wonder, um, qu uh, my question is, uh, can you recommend some ideas how, how to practice that and uh, what some examples uh, did well in England? Uh, you think is they, they did a very good job in conservation program and uh, maybe you can introduce some about that, thank you. So, so your question is about how do you how do you preserve uh, uh, sort of buildings, heritage. specific buildings? Yes, uh, heritage in traditional villages, because some community, they not want to participate in some jobs related to that, and uh, the, they always rely on the government. If government um, not want to do something, and uh, the cultural heritage will not get some protect, and I want to know how to engage, communicate, to participate in, in England, the, just like some kisses. Okay, so, yeah. so essentially kind of the local solutions found within communities. Have we got some good examples of those? I'll kick off a little bit. Um, is this on? No. It will be. It will be now. I, th I think there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a good process, I think, to, to first understand risk. And I think it's about, it's understanding vulnerability. So how vulnerable are those sites? And a lot of debate about when you look at coastline is an assumption that because it's by the coast, it's going to be at risk. Well, that may not always be the case. Um, and so there's, there's a way of asking questions about what's the hazard, how sensitive are places, how exposed are they? And then you can evaluate what, the, what, what level of vulnerability and risk you're dealing with. And the best way of doing that is with the communities, the community leaders and people responsible to, for those places to actually ask those questions and work through what it does it mean for heritage. But also broadly, what does that then mean for local society and the economy? So, so if, you're, if you're, your society is built on those, those heritage places and values, but people live there and they need to earn a living and they need to be able to, 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 to um, you know, keep a roof over their heads, bring them with you have those conversations. Um, and I think there are some challenging examples in the UK, which are not less necessarily heritage examples, but cases where 
there are communities which are at risk from um, sea level rise and eroding coastlines. Um, and, and one of the challenges there is that um, the, you know, th people aren't bringing them with them. They're seeing this, this enormous change because they're residents, they're homeowners, and they, they bought properties on the coastline and they're seeing the risk in them disappearing. You know, and, and I think, the, the, you know, how could we done more to, to bring those people into the debate? Because at the moment, they're feeling that they're powerless. And that's what we don't want people to feel. We want people to feel empowered to, to be part of the conversation and debate and find the ways of saying, well, what's the best option for it? Managing change might be one thing. You can still have the choice and option of, of defences if that's what you want to do, if you can find the way of, of finding the money and resources to do that. Because all of this is, is ultimately about making choices. But they've got to be informed choices that make sure that we, we can um, either make an informed process of loss or an informed process of protection. And, and I'll just pick up an, a slightly different example on the same theme, and that is that in terms of historic building styles and traditions, there's actually there, there's that inbuilt knowledge of not just kind of uh, coastal and flooding uh, remedies, but also how you might adapt for earthquakes. So my example would be if you look at Haiti, which had a terrible earthquake uh, a number of years ago, the, the traditional buildings in Haiti, the, the gingerbread houses, which are timber frame buildings, uh, only 5% of those buildings were destroyed, whereas the, the, the vast majority of the other concrete structures disappeared. So there's something really interesting in traditional and indigenous building styles, which we should be taking attention to as well. I just want to add about the about engagement as well. So it's not really to do with like vernacular his, heritage sites and things like that. But um, uh, uh, there's a, a, a charity called the Scape Trust in Scotland, and they deal with um, heritage that's at risk of being lost to erosion and things like that. And they ran a, a project called Sharp where they actively, one side of the project was getting volunteers to map the coastline, what they saw, things like that. And then also the second half was to go to communities and instead of going in and saying, you've got something really cool here, let's do something with it, they were like, actually, just come to us. If, you've got some, if you feel you've got something really cool, um, come to us and we'll see what we can do with it. So they've done excavations, reconstructions, all sorts of, all, all sorts of different things based on what, what, the, what communities came forward and what projects they wanted. Um, so, like, one part of your sort of question seemed to be about engagement with local people and things like that. Go in and, and, and collaborate, basically. Don't go in and say, this is important, why aren't you looking at that? Go in and say, actually, what is important to you? Because sometimes it might not be the obvious thing. Um, and that's a way of giving uh, communities ownership and empowerment, uh, is not to go in and say, put that down, that's not interesting, this is what you should be concentrating on. It's actually to say, do you find this interesting? Because we could do something with that if you want. Uh, let's, let's do it, let's have a dig, let's, have, um, let's do, some, do something with local skills and things like that. But that's a really good example of, uh, of a charity that I think did an excellent, excellent job. Thank you, Tanya. Oh, we're going to take one final question, and that's, that's here, and then we're going to, to finish. So the, the last question, uh, and then I'm going to hand over to Magnus. Hi, uh, my name is Rasha Obeid. I uh, mostly worked in uh, post-war conflict reconstruction in Yemen. Uh, my question is also about communities. Uh, how, if there's a communities within communities that marginalized uh, or or their voices are, are not heard. How can you engage communities making sure that uh, uh, those communities are in, involved, especially if we're talking about a physical heritage that can be uh, specific to a group, that the loss of that um, physical place can be basically the eradication of the whole, if, let's say, ethnic group or uh, their, their history in, this, in the place. So. Uh, and thank you very much for the information. It was very br uh, brilliant uh, presentation. Thanks. So how, how, do you, how do you engage with that really diverse range of, of stakeholders, I guess? Have we, I mean, there are, there are multiple techniques that you can apply, but have, are there any specific examples people can think of? Yeah, I mean, it's just the, it's the difficulty with engaging with, with people as well. Sometimes it's not the loudest voices that you need yeah. to listen to. Um, so, yeah, there's just there's a lot of different literature about how to set up things like that and how to target specific groups. But what you said was really interesting, actually, about um, 
you know, I've, I, I know this whole talk, I've basically been talking about how great loss is, let's just embrace it, whatever, throw it into the sea. Um, don't quote me on that, that's not what I said. Um, but yeah, that's a really important point, is actually, if when loss does, does um, equate to some sort of loss of cult cultural tie with a landscape or something like that, then, um, I mean, the only thing that I can think of off the top of my head is, is thinking about how how do you engage, like, different ways of engaging with that and creating, again, going off Alex's point, the creativity, so taking, like, the essence of what is important there and, and taking that forward. But as for sort of specific engagement strategies for hard-to-reach groups, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. There's, it's so dependent on the groups that you're talking to and things. Yeah. One of the, I suppose, one of the techniques, if we can call it a technique, and I'm bound to say this, is mapping... <laughs> because through mapping, you empower, for example, as well. So by engaging in a wide range of communities and a wide range of stakeholders, particularly getting them to map sites, sometimes even monitor sites. It doesn't have to involve um, high technology. It doesn't have to involve uh, satellite mapping. It doesn't have to involve anything gee whiz. You know, just the act and the process of creating uh, maps so that there is a... Um, a communal sort of understanding of what is valuable um, comes through. I think that's, that's a really good method of doing it because quite often when you map something, and this is something you see in sort of counter mapping initiatives all around the world, but when you map something, you're actually selecting what is valuable to you. And I think having an exercise where you engage communities in mapping sites, sometimes you get to learn what is actually valuable to them that you might not otherwise know. Um, so there's plenty of mapping initiatives, counter-mapping initiatives. OK, you can look at sort of land rights and, and that sort of thing at one side, but you can also look very much the other end of the spectrum, which is about purely mapping um, villages, mapping sites of what is actually important to, to particular communities. There's a great, a great study that was done looking at mapping the slums, for example, in Bangladesh. I think it was in Dakar. And that was a, a great way of actually just empowering those communities that were totally underrepresented. And again, through the process of mapping something, actually you create a document sometimes that is listened to by those in power and are making decisions. Funny that. I mean, we, <laughs> there's a whole other debate there. But I think through doing that, you actually get an idea of what is important, and then you externalize it and share it so that that is captured by so many people. And that, that is a way of empowering, I think. Can I just say yeah, final, final word? Right. Final word is this is what really excites me about the work we're doing in coastal connections because different communities in different parts of the world will have different ways of dealing with this. And it's so important that we share and learn and we're not just making assumptions because we do it like this, everyone needs to do it. And I think that's that's some of the most exciting approaches I've seen to community engagement have been in East Africa where they have totally different approaches that we would assume. I'd love to learn more about that. That's so much, such, that's the opportunity, is actually how do we talk to people about this? How do, they, how do they tell us what they think and feel? And I think that's going to have different roots. But I think collectively, it's all about do we value, what do we value about places? What do we want to see for the future? Thank you, Rob. Just very quickly, just on the storytelling aspect, I think that visibility um, for those people who are there experiencing that and have that connection can go such a long way. And um, having the right voice, I'm not necessarily saying you have to go on and be on screen and be that presenter, but having somebody that you can connect to can just go so much further, you know, as well as then having that understanding and science and mapping to back it up. I think that together could be, you know, the real tool for change. Like the mapping and filmmaking and things like that, giving some people a tangible product at the end is yeah. so important. Because um, so many initiatives, they just they they fizzle out, or the community don't actually see anything come from it, and it leads to real disillusionment. So yeah, if you produce a film or if you produce a map and you can see it and it's there and you're on it, it's it, it that that's a way to keep keep a community as well, and keep those voices that you don't normally hear engaged uh, and give them confidence. Thank you. That, that tells you the danger of saying that you have the last word, because clearly <laughs> Rob didn't have the last word. Uh, <laughs> Lizzie, Tanya, uh, Alex and Rob, thank you very much for, for coming up here. being a fantastic panel. I'm going to hand over to Magnus just for some closing remarks. Let's get
I think you've said it, there are no last words in this conversation. It feels very much like the beginning of a conversation, but it's been incredibly thoughtful. I think that, to me, that's kind of the attribute that I would use to qualify what we've just heard, and you know, I really want to thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm not going to try and recap um, uh, the, the key messages here. I think we, all, we should all do that for ourselves, and luckily we filmed this because we want to make sure that um, these are assets that we can continue to share. So uh, soon we will be able to send recordings of this, not just to you, but to anybody, everyone else who hasn't seen it. If you feel you'd like to share it with other people, then please, please do so. Um, change, as we all know, change is nothing new. But I think what we're dealing with and what we've heard a lot is about this accelerated pace of change, uh, which really stretches our individual and collective capacity to respond and make decisions and, uh, and act. And, and doing, doing so by creating some sort of consensus, which is about conversations, which we've heard a lot about, um, what matters and why, uh, which really means talking <laughs> and listening to one another, which is not really what uh, humankind has always been very, very, very good about. So I think there's a big, uh, big invitation here. Um, and, um, and I think that's very much um, the ethos and the spirit of how World Monuments Fund uh, is and has been working across the world for uh, coming up to, to 60 years in, in a couple of years' time, enshrined in this mission to safeguard, but, um, and currently working on 50-plus life projects across the globe, um, including um, crisis response and, and, and post-conflict recovery and rehabilitation projects, which, which John referred to. But as I think most importantly for someone who has just joined this organization and beginning to, uh, to understand its, um, its ethos better, it's kind of this, the, the, um, the ethos of working hand in hand with local partners and, and, and working hand in hand with communities about, and about long-term sustainable cultural, social, and economic outcomes, which are tangible and meaningful for people's lives. <laughs> because really, if, if there isn't that, we know that nothing really much enduring can happen and you can spend a lot of money um, and with, without, without anything much uh, happening, uh, certainly in the long term. So I hope, I hope you've enjoyed, and not just enjoyed, but found this a thought-provoking um, and hopefully even inspiring um, conversation. Uh, we look forward to continuing along those lines of having important conversations which open up um, themes um, rather than closing them down, and, and very much at the intersection of different disciplines, as we've very much um, attempted to do today, and breaking down those silos uh, of the worlds, the different worlds of, of preservations of which we're all part of. Um, and I think this conversation really has shown, shown the value of that. So going forward, we'd like to continue to interweave the conversation between heritage, wildlife, and natural habitat preservation, the human rights, bigger socioeconomic themes and agendas, uh, and, and very much doing that through the concrete examples of projects which uh, World Monuments Fund and our colleagues around the world are, are involved with, and in each case, our lived experiences um, are working in the field, and really about foregrounding the shared human experience, which is really where, I think, where we find the common ground that gets us uh, uh, to join and, 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 and do something meaningful for all of us. So please watch out for our program uh, from the autumn onward. The next 12 months will be a very significant ones for, for us as an organization, uh, not least the launch of our next watch cycle uh, towards the end of this year, beginning of next year, uh, which will provide many opportunities for conversations with, uh, with colleagues and communities around the country and across the world, and we very much hope that many of you will be part of that and certainly will help us spread the word. So please um, do, um, do get in touch with us. Come and talk to us. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be staying here for a little while for those who do uh, register your interest um, in the normal way through our platforms. And if you'd like to get involved more specifically, then uh, do raise your hands. So all there's left for me to say is, is once again, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, take, the, uh, take, take the message out, and mo most importantly, uh, enjoy the rest of this beautiful summer evening. Thank you. Thank you.